So we've seen that um, the unemployment rate fluctuates a lot over the business cycle. We've seen at the same time that the efficient unemployment rate is uh, very stable over time. So that means that the unemployment gap is going to fluctuate over the business cycle. So in bad times, you'll have too much unemployment. In good times, you'll be close to efficiency. Or in fact, um, sometimes we saw you'll have uh, too little unemployment. Um, so that's what's, um, that's what's going on in the economy. So you have some slags that fluctuate, and these fluctuations are inefficient. At the same time, we saw that uh, monetary policy, by controlling interest rates, uh, was able to stabilize aggregate demand and therefore uh, was, you know, to control aggregate demand to some extent. Therefore, it could be used to bring the unemployment rate uh, closer to the efficient level. And in fact, of course, in the real world, there are lags and monetary policy doesn't act immediately, but uh, theoretically, it could be used to always keep the unemployment gap, so the, between the actual unemployment rate and the efficient unemployment rate to zero. Uh, and you know that would be desirable in a world in which uh, social, you know, welfare is uh, determined by uh, the unemployment rate. So exactly like what we had seen in our beverage and framework. Um, so that's what in a world like this, in which having the unemployment rate at the right level is what maximizes welfare, and that's what you would want to do. Um, so what we are going to do now is to formalize a little bit this, so see in which types of uh, model. This is uh, what we would want to do for monetary policy. And then we'll see in these types of models that satisfy this condition, we'll derive a formula to give us the optimal uh, monetary policy. And, and this formula will express it in terms of sufficient statistics. So that is, we'll express it in, in terms of uh, statistics that we'll, we'll be able to measure in the data. And, of, and you know, these statistics, in fact, they've been measured already in the data. So I'll tell you like what the value of these statistics are. And then we can use that to uh, describe the optimal uh, monetary policy. So, so here we are going to get a sufficient statistic formula for optimal monetary policy. So that's going to be you know, one aspect of the sufficient statistic approach is that it applies to a broad range of models, um, So, which is good because on the theory front, for many different models, you can use the same formula. And then on the empirical front, it means that you know, even if the world is not described specifically by, you know, by one specific model, uh, you're still not, you know, you're not too worried about using the formula because you know that it can apply in a broad range of uh, situations. So that's one of the appeal of the sufficient statistic approach. It doesn't rely on one specific structural uh, model. Um, but nevertheless, these formulas, they don't apply to any model. So let's uh, here flesh out a bit what are the conditions that have to hold for our, for our formula to, uh, to be applicable. Uh, what are the theoretical conditions? So we'll make a couple of assumptions. So you know, that's really in that sense that uh, we'll make some assumptions. So we'll impose some structure, but the goal always with a sufficient statistic approach is you have to impose some structure to get some policy recommendation, but you want to impose as little structure as possible um, so that your formula applies as broadly as possible. Um, so we'll make a few st uh, structural assumptions, but we'll try to keep that uh, to a minimum. So uh, first assumption is that we'll, uh, of course, to think about optimal monetary policy, you know, and so here we'll focus particularly on the, interest, the nominal interest rate that the Fed should set. So you should be in a world in which nominal interest rates can actually control aggregate demand and have an impact in the economy. Otherwise, it would be totally meaningless to do this type of analysis. So we'll focus on models that are called neo Vixelians model after Vixel. Uh, so the term neo Vixelian and this class of model was uh, studied uh, by Mike Woodford uh, in his tech books for 2003. So these neo Vixelian models, what are they? These are models uh, in which um, interest rates can uh, stabilize the economy. 
So monetary policy by setting interest rate, uh, it will be able to actually stabilize your economy. Of course, you have models in which um, you know the nominal interest rate uh, may not be relevant, and so our formula wouldn't be uh, applicable there. But um, so actually, I should say the nominal interest rate. because that's what the Fed um, sets. So in which the nominal interest rate can stabilize the economy. Uh, okay, and so then it makes sense to try to determine the optimal uh, nominal interest rate. And so for instance, uh, the dynamic model of, the dynamic model of slack that we've introduced, which comes from uh, a paper um, that I wrote with Emmanuel uh, says um, this would be like one such model because we saw there that the nominal interest rate controls aggregate demand. So this would be a model in which this analysis applies. But any model in which the nominal interest rate can stabilize the economy is going to uh, is going to work. So that's one thing. So basically this is this is a model in which. Uh, monetary um, policy is non-neutral, so it needs to have an impact, and conducted uh, through the nominal interest rate, which is exactly what's going on in, the, in reality. Okay, so for, uh, first condition. Second assumption, uh, we're going to assume that uh, we're focusing on models in which the divine coincidence uh, holds. So this is something that a concept that was introduced by um, Blanchard and Galli. So what is a divine coincidence? Well, the, you know, in practice, we know that the Fed mandate they have to um, stabilize inflation and they have to maintain uh, full employment but in models in which so these are two objectives and you know they may not be aligned but in models in which you have the divine coincidence uh, that whole inflation will be at uh, its target level so say like two percent for instance in the us uh, when uh, unemployment rate is efficient. So basically, these are models in which uh, these are models in which the objectives of the Fed are actually aligned. So the two objectives, say in the US, it's price stability. So of course. That doesn't mean like prices don't move. It means that you have a low stable inflation rate, like maybe 2% plus full employment. Again, full employment doesn't mean zero unemployment, but it means that unemployment is, um, I think, you know, at its efficient level. So the two objectives of the Fed are aligned. So here there is no, you know, there is no trade-off between inflation and unemployment in this model. If you can bring unemployment to its efficient level, then inflation will be uh, at its target level. And so that can, you know, that can happen under uh, two conditions. Uh, it can be either because inflation is fixed or doesn't, you know, inflation is fixed slash exogenous. You know, it could be varying, but exogenously, because in a world like this, uh, the Fed can't do anything about inflation. And so the only thing you can do is the only thing on which the Fed can act is actually to bring the economy at full employment because there's no control over inflation. Or two, uh, price dynamics are such uh, that inflation reaches target when uh, when the unemployment rate is efficient. And so inflation is fixed exogenous. This would be, for instance, what we have in the um, paper with the manuals that I mentioned. So that's one possibility. Price dynamics are subject inflation, which is target when you equal U star. That's actually what's 
Uh, actually, Blanchard and Galli have a paper exactly like this uh, in the AJ Macro, in which um, you have a new Keynesian framework on product market matching framework on the labor market, and then you can show that when unemployment is efficient, inflation is going to be at target. All right, so we have so far two conditions, and we need to introduce a third one. So we have neo vixelian model, so interest rate control, aggregate demand dividend coincidence, so you have only one objective. Uh, you don't need to worry about second one. And then the third condition that's related to what we've been talking about is that uh, you have a beverage curve, and why do we assume that? Well, it's so that uh, you will have a model in which there is unemployment. So that's one good thing. If uh, you know in the framework with a beverage curve to have uh, unemployment, and two, uh, the efficient. Uh, unemployment rate. Uh, can be measured by sufficient statistics, which, which would be very helpful to then uh, be able to implement optimal monetary policy. Uh, so, for instance, you know we saw that u star equals square root u v. Uh, you know, like that would be one way in a beverage curve model with a few extra assumption. Uh, that's what you get, and if if, if you study, if you relax the assumption, you just assume the beverage curve, you have a more sophisticated formulas, but that only involve a few sufficient statistics, slope of the beverage curve, cost of recruiting, and uh, cost of unemployment, social cost of unemployment. Uh, okay, but so we want that beverage curve to be able to have, to be able to get U star in terms of sufficient statistics. Uh, so these are the three conditions that we, that we are going to assume. So this general framework that we'll use for the analysis, you know, uh, given uh, what we've assumed, you know, you could call it a divine Vixel beverage framework. And in this divine Vixel beverage framework, we'll derive a formula for optimal policy and in whatever model fits into that divine Vixel beverage framework, um, the formula for optimal monetary policy is going to hold. And so one example of such uh, a model that fits into this is that uh, for instance, the economical um, business cycle model um, that we talked about uh, in the lectures that I uh, developed with um, with Emmanuel, that would be uh, that would be an example of such divine Dixel Beirut framework. Uh, but they, you know, there are others uh, that would fall in that uh, category, of course. But this one is maybe the simplest one. Maybe the simplest uh, divine Dixel Beirut model. And so we'll, uh, we'll develop a formula that apply in any of these models. So for any given Vixel Beirut model. So that's what we're going uh, to do in this lecture. 